few group announcements. Uh, we're going to go ahead and have a game night in two weeks from tonight, 5 o'clock in Fellowship Hall. Just fun. Bring some snacks, bring some board games. We're hanging out. We're just going to hang out and do board games. Kids are invited. It's all church activity. We're just going to have some fun. Chill them out and play them board games, okay? In two weeks from tonight. Also, this week is our seniors' lunch at Sizzler, okay? At 11.30, and it's open to everyone, and uh, so senior lunch. All right. So today's Mother's Day, as you all know, but for us, it's also another special day in that it's also um, Jared and Aaron's birthdays. So 24 years ago, today, they made an entrance into this world, twins. Jared was 4'8", and Aaron was 6'3". I remember those numbers. I remember that day very well. So a momentous day that changed our lives forever and ever and ever. I still don't know how it happened. So, But my, my kids are a blessing. So we've been, we've been talking about transformation. Transformation. We've looked at our spiritual health, our physical health, our mental health, our emotional health. This week we want to talk about our relational health. More specifically, I want us to look at diffusing fears that ruin relationships. And today we're going to go back to the book of Genesis, where it began. And you can turn to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. We're going to look at the first couple, Adam and Eve. And we know the story that God created the universe. He created the earth. He created the earth with a sustaining environment. And he put, put people on there. And why? Because God wanted a family. He wanted somebody to love. If he hadn't wanted a family, he wouldn't have created it all. But he, he created us to love us and be in his family. So he made Adam and Eve, Adam and put him in the Garden of Eden, a perfect paradise. Adam had everything he could possibly want, except that he was lonely. And God said, it's not good for man to be alone. So he caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam and took out one of his ribs, and out of that rib, God made woman, Adam's partner, for life. Now there's a symbolism here, maybe you've heard it at a wedding ceremony. He didn't take her from his feet, where he would lord over her. He didn't take her from his head, where she would lord over him. But he took his wife from his side, where she would be his equal, his partner. He took, from, took her from a rib, close to his heart, as a symbol that she is to be deeply loved. There's a lot more we could say about that, but that's not the direction we're going this week. But God put Adam into sleep, took a rib from Adam, created a woman. And can you imagine, Adam wakes up and sees Eve for the first time. What's he say? He says, whoa, man. Whoa, man. Wo wo woman. That sounds good. Woman. I'll call her a woman. And things went really great for a long time between man and woman because there's no sin, no sadness, no sickness, no sorrow, no lying, no manipulating, no jealousy. They had a perfect relationship for a long time. But then you know the story, don't you? Satan comes to Eve and he lies to her and he says, didn't God say you can't eat of the fruit of the trees? And Eve responds, well, we can eat of every tree except one. God said if we eat of that tree, we will die. Satan responds, well, that's not so. You, you won't die. God just doesn't want you to eat from that tree because he doesn't want you to be like him. So Satan starts history with a basic lie that hasn't changed much. He will tell you, God is holding out on you. He's hold, he wants you to hold back. He wants to hold you back. He wants to take the fun out of life. God's old-fashioned. God really isn't that good because he's keeping something from you. And Eve fell for that line. So we're going to read the account starting in Genesis 3. And we're going to start at verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was pleasant to the eyes, and that a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. And the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, The woman whom you gave me to be with me, she gave of the tree and I ate it. 
And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between her seed, your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and, and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I have commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake, and toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the herb of the field, and the sweat of your face you shall eat the bread. So you return to the ground, for out of it you are taken. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she is the mother of all the living. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. There is so much in these few verses. So much. But today I just want to pull out some, some truth about relationships. About relationships. There are three fundamental fears that started in the first relationship when sin entered and are still present today, and they can damage and destroy relationships. So let's look at these. Three fears that ruin relationships. Number one, the fear of exposure. This fear causes distance between people. Why can't I get close to people, you might think? Why can't I seem to get, get close to anybody? You see, the fear of exposure makes me distant. Why is this? There's a lot in you that you don't like, and because you don't like it about you, you certainly don't want anybody else to see it. Isn't that true? There's a lot about you you don't like, and you're like, if I get too close, somebody's going to see who I am, and that's really not what I want. Because when people get close to you, they see you warts and all. The closer people get, the more they see your blemishes and your mistakes and your faults, and your failures, and your weaknesses. And we all have this core fear that if people really knew us, they wouldn't like us. And so instead of being close or vulnerable, we wear masks. Verses 9 and 10 says this, God called Adam, why are you hiding? Adam said, I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid. Now whenever God asks you a question, he already knows the answer. God wasn't in the garden going, I wonder where Adam went. I have no idea. I better call him. No, it wasn't that. God knew. You see, he doesn't ask questions for his benefit. He asked them for yours. He was asking the question for Adam's benefit because he wanted Adam to own up. He wants Adam to man up and accept responsibility for his actions. Any transformation in any area of your life, including relationships, starts with owning up and being honest to God and honest with yourself that your relationships are not what they could be. So Adam was afraid, and he hid. Friends, fear always causes us to hide. Hiding solves nothing. Just like Adam, you can't fool God, so why do we try? You see, God wants us to be real. He doesn't want us to fake it. But until you face it, it can't be fixed. And notice what excuse Adam gave for hiding. He said, I was naked. What's it mean to be naked? He was talking up here more about than just physical nakedness. There's an emotional nakedness too. To be naked means to be exposed, to be vulnerable, to be authentic, to be unprotected. You're never more vulnerable when you're naked and there's nothing to hide. You see, when we're afraid of vulnerability, afraid of being open, afraid of being honest, afraid of letting people see us as we are, our fear of exposure makes us distant. So I want you to notice the damage that fear does to relationships. There are three stages. We see them all here. Phase one is shame. Once they disobeyed God, the first thing that entered the relationship was shame. When you disobey God, shame enters. It says they suddenly felt their nakedness. Fear is based on shame. Why? Because they knew that they had done what God told them not to do and they had no excuse. They were guilty. I think we've all been there, haven't we? When we disobeyed God and we just knew it. And we had, we had, no, we had no recourse. And you see, that can lead to shame setting in, which leads to number two, which is cover-up. This is what happens when we feel ashamed and trying to conceal who we really are. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. If you've ever seen a fig leaf, you know it's not very big, right? Some people take a lot of fig leaves to cover up. 
And today we have sophisticated ways of covering up. You see, most people are into what I call image management. They choose the image and play the part, and their whole life is to get you to see what they want you to see. They want to manage their image. That could mean wearing the right clothes, driving the right car, living in a certain kind of house, eating the right kind of restaurants. I mean, think about it. A lot of people use cars as image reflections. I mean, what's the function of a car to get you from point A to point B, right? In comfort. You can get a really comfortable car for probably twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000, but yet there are people who spend $150,000 on a car. Why? Image, right? It's like, I look so good in that car. It makes me feel so rich to drive that car. Image, they want people to think the best about them. It can mean, it can mean holding people at a distance with humor or sarcasm. Image management may even be doing good works so people will think well of you. Today, a lot of people hide behind an online image. Most people have a Facebook, right? You have Facebook. If you don't have one, it's probably because you don't have a computer. By the way, like us on Facebook and you'll see a lot of stuff about our church. Just a little tip there. But they have an online thing or they have an Instagram and everybody's life looks pretty perfect on Facebook, doesn't it? There's, one of, there's two kinds of people on Facebook. The ones where everything is joyful, the other person where everything is horrible. So I don't know which one you are. But a lot of people project an image online, which is sort of a new thing, isn't it? So they, they fake it. Faking it reveals fear, at least of the third phase, which is distance from God. And they hid from God among the trees. Isn't it interesting that before that, they, they looked for God to walk with Him in the cool of the day, the Bible says. They walked with him, they talked with him, and when they sinned, what did they do? They wanted to get away from God. Sin causes us, when sin is undealt with, sin causes us to withdraw from God because of shame. Years ago, a book was written called, Why Am I Afraid to Tell You Who I Really Am? The answer to that question was, I'm afraid to tell you who I really am because you may not like who I really am. So there's no way I'm going to let you see who I really am because you might reject me. They hid from God among the trees. We not only start fearing other people, but we start fearing God out of shame. Shame disconnects us from God as well as others. Now listen, there's two types of fear of God. One fear of God, like we're talking about here, that fear of God is, is, is brought on by shame, and it causes us to draw away from God. The proper fear of God is where we behold His awesomeness and we revere Him. That fear of God causes us to draw near to God. What we're talking about here is the fear that, that it's shame. It's like, God, I just, I don't want to be near you because I'm ashamed of who I am and what I've done. Listen, here's a good news for you today. God does not expect you to be perfect. He doesn't. But he does expect you to be honest. To be honest. When you think God is somehow disappointed with you, the last thing you want to do is draw near. But friends, we underestimate his love and mercy. Because when we fall short, the very thing we must do is go against our instinct to draw away and instead draw near to God. Because near Him is where you find His grace and His mercy and His love. Draw near to God. You see, when you make a mistake, when you fall, guess what? He already knows all about it. He already knows. It's like, I'm going to hide from God. Then He won't know that I sinned. Think about what you just said. He knows. He knows. And he's saying, what will my child do? See, the second fear we see in Adam and Eve is the fear of disapproval. Now we move from simply hiding and running and covering up to being defensive. And we're not just excusing ourselves, we're accusing others. In this stage, when I have the fear of disapproval, I start pointing my finger at everyone else. When you fear disapproval, you go from excusing to accusing. The more critical a person is, the more you know they fear disapproval. I'll say it again. The more critical, the more perfectionistic, the more attacking somebody else, they're always putting somebody down. The more you know that person fears disapproval, and that's the way it shows up. The more I fear disapproval of my life, the more I'm going to point at other people. Verse 12, God asked, did you eat what I told you not to eat? Adam answered, you gave me this woman and she gave me the fruit, so I ate it. Adam took it like a man. He blamed his wife. 
and he's not even really blaming his wife. He's blaming God. He says, God, you gave me this woman. If you hadn't made that woman, me and you would still be close. We were close before she came into the picture. We were like this. And now look what she did. She ruined it for us, God. She messed me up. So Adam's not only blaming Eve, he's blaming God. He's passing the responsibility. But I hate to tell you this, ladies, but Eve wasn't any more willing to accept it than Adam was. Eve said, the serpent deceived me, so I ate it. So Adam blames his wife. Eve blames, blames the snake. And of course, you know, the snake didn't have a leg to stand on. So my fear of disapproval makes me defensive. It happens in marriage relationships all the time. It goes like this. Your spouse is something to you with just a hint of disapproval. And what do you do? You fire back defensively with some comment, and then the battle begins. And that's not the prescription for a healthy marriage, let alone a healthy relationship. My fear of exposure makes me distant. My fear of disapproval makes me defensive. But there's a third fear here. It's the fear of losing control. My fear of losing control makes me demanding. The result of Adam and Eve's sin is they lost control. Do you realize that God gave them control of the entire garden? God said to Adam, Hey, Adam, I trust you to name all the animals. Here, Adam, I trust you to tend this beautiful garden. They lost control. They lost everything. They lost control of their future. They lost control of their destiny. They got kicked out of paradise. And they're feeling out of control because they were out of control. In this situation, my fear of losing control can make me demanding. Let me say it this way. The more out of control you feel, the more controlling you become. I start bossing everybody around. I start making demands. I start protecting myself. I start defending, demanding, and demeaning. I start dominating. The more insecure you are, the greater you have a need to get your way. Friends, when there's somebody around you that wants to have their way, they're very insecure inside. If you're very secure, you don't need to have your way all the time. It doesn't bother you for people to have their way. But if you're insecure, you really have to have your way and you fight for control. In verse 16, God says to Eve, your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. The Berkeley version says he will dominate you. This is where the war of the sexes began, right there. All the misunderstanding between men and women, and husbands and wives, and boyfriends and girlfriends, all the confusion, the conflict, the jockeying for power and position, all the bargaining about who's going to be in control, it goes back to this situation where sin entered the picture. It's not a whole lot of fun to be in a relationship where sin is dominating, when you're not cooperating but competing. Would you like to move from competition to cooperation in your marriage? Where you're not fighting with each other, but you're fighting together against other things? Where you're on the same team? How do you do that? What is the antidote that transforms a relationship and relieves these three fears? The fear of exposure, the fear of disapproval, the fear of losing control that causes me to be distant and defensive and demanding. There's only one antidote to the fears, friends. It's spelled L-O-V-E, love. Learn to live in God's love. That's the antidote. 1 John 4.18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. You want to get rid of fear in relationships? You've got to get God's love there. Want to get rid of fear in your career? Get God's love in there. You want to get fear out of your education or whatever you're facing? Get God's love in in there. Because wherever God's love is, there is no fear. Because God's perfect love drives out fear. When you invite God's love into the front door of your heart, fear goes out the back door. Why? Because fear and love can't live in the same house. When you're filled, filled with the love of God, fear must leave. You ever, you ever notice that people will stand around watching a burning building? burning down. And they're like, well, that's dangerous. I'm not going in there. Who runs in to save the kid? It's mom. Why? Because mom's love trumps the fear. Her perfect love. Love is greater than fear. Since that's the case, we need to learn how to live in God's love. How do we do this? How do I learn to live in God's love? I'm going to give you some things to help you. 
Number one, every day surrender my heart to God. Every morning before you start the day, Lord, I surrender to you. Lord, fill me with your love. See, the closer you get to God, the more his love will fill your heart. God is love. The further away you get from God, the more fear will fill your heart. Friends, God is love, and when you're close to him, you know his love and you feel his love. But if you draw away from him, the further you draw away, the worse it's going to get with fear because fear is stronger where God is not. Stay close to God, and his love casts out insecurity and anxiety and fear. We don't look to the book of Job much for encouragement, but in the New Living Translation of Job 11, 13 through 18, says this. If only you would prepare your heart and lift up your hands to him in prayer. Get rid of your sins and leave all iniquity behind you, then your face will brighten with innocence. You'll be strong and free of fear. You'll forget your misery. It will be like water flowing away. Your life will be brighter than the noonday. Even darkness shall be as bright as morning. Having hope will give you courage. You'll be protected and will rest in safety. Those verses have three commands and eight promises. But to summarize, if you surrender your heart to him and get rid of sin, you'll be free from fear and full of hope and courage. So surrender to him and let his love fill your heart. So not only surrender, but number two, every day I remember the way God loves me. You have to pause every day and remember how much God loves you. If you don't feel loved by God, you're certainly not going to love anybody else. You see, the devil wants to tell you that God doesn't love you. The devil will point to all these things in your life and say, well, see, God really doesn't love you. Friends, rest assured that nothing in your life, nothing in your life takes away from the fact that God loves you. Remind yourself every day. Let me give you four things that God thinks about you. Four things. Number one, I'm completely accepted. I'm completely accepted. Let's say that together. I'm completely accepted. One more time. I'm completely accepted. I hope that sinks in. That's important because the deepest wounds of your life are caused by rejection. We spend so much of our lives trying to earn the acceptance and avoid rejection from our parents, our peers, and even those we respect, and even total strangers. Because we want respect, we want to be accepted, we don't want to be rejected. See, there's a myth that says, if I could just be perfect, everybody would like me. Guess what? Jesus was perfect, and not everybody liked him. So you can't live your life according to other people's opinions. No matter who you are, how good you are, how great you are, how awesome you are, somebody's not going to like it. But here's the good news. You don't need everybody's approval to be happy. You don't need people's approval. You, we can't live to be accepted by people. Guess what? The issue of your acceptance has already been settled by God. If God accepts you, it doesn't matter who else does not because God's opinion about you is what carries the day. He accepts you. Titus 3, 7, it says, Jesus, Jesus made us acceptable to God. What he did on the cross made us acceptable. What he did on the cross reconciled us to the Father and took away the sin and brought us to the Father. Jesus made us acceptable. The next thing we see is this. I'm unconditionally loved. He loves you unconditionally. Two things about God's love is it's consistent and unconditional. Consistent means God is not fickle. God doesn't love you really a lot one day and not so much the next day. God doesn't change his mind about you. God's love is consistent. It's unconditional. You see, God never says, I love you if you do this, or I love you if you behave a certain way. God just says, I love you, end of story. You can't make God stop loving you. God will never love you more than this very second. He will never love you any less in this very second. No one will love you more than God ever, than God does. You never need to ask yourself, I wonder if God loves me today. Guess what? I want you to know something. God loves you. It's not just something Christians say, friends. 
It's not just a wonderful platitude to make us feel warm inside. God loves me, so I feel better. No, it's truth. God loves you. See, God's love is not based on what you do, but who He is. He is perfect love. We get into trouble when we doubt God's love. And when we doubt God's love, we get fearful. Jeremiah 31 3. Listen, this is the Old Testament. And God says, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. He loves us with an everlasting, eternal love. The third thing God says is this I'm totally forgiven. I'm totally forgiven. So why am I carrying shame? Why am I holding on to shame? I am forgiven. Do you realize that before you were even born, before you were even born, God knew you, and He knew the things you would do, and He chose to love you anyway. He chose to love you anyway. He chose to forgive you anyway. He loves you and He forgives you. Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Listen, your sins are wiped out. God doesn't rehearse your sins. He releases your sins. Your sins are not only forgiven, but God has put them aside. They're not credited to your account any longer. You're forgiven. You're totally forgiven. You're freely forgiven. And you say, well, you don't know what I've done. You're right, I don't know what you've done. But guess what? Whatever you've done, the cross is powerful enough to take away the deepest sin in your life. You say, well, I've sinned so many times. Guess what? His forgiveness lasts as many times as you need. You can never, you can never run out of the forgiving power of Jesus Christ. He's always there. What else does God think about you? I'm considered extremely valuable. I'm valuable. Let's say this. I'm considered extremely valuable. A little more conviction, please. Come on now. Let's go. I'm, you know, I'm considered extremely valuable. It's like sort of like Austin said it or something. Though. Come on. Yeah. All right. <laughs> we joke about Austin because he's the eternally tired kid. So let's do it again. I'm considered extremely valuable. I'm valuable, right? How much do you think you're worth? Now, I'm not talking about your net worth. Thank the Lord. The Lord doesn't deal with us about net worth, does he? If it was about net worth, we'd all, oh, I'd be in trouble. Like, what's your net worth? Let's not talk about net worth, right? It's not about your valuables or your bank account or your money. It's talking about you. You are personally valuable to God. What makes something valuable? There are two things that create value. One is who owns it. The value depends on who owns it. And the other is what's somebody willing to pay for it. Who owns it? For example, if I had a toothbrush at auction, it would be far more valuable if I could prove it was John Lennon's toothbrush as opposed to David Rowley's toothbrush. Right? If I said, this is Dave's toothbrush, people would be like, keep it. Don't want Dave's used toothbrush. Right? But if you could say, this was John Lennon's. I could, get, I could get millions for that thing, couldn't I? Who owns it? Who owns it? A bed owned by Abraham Lincoln is infinitely more valuable than whatever you slept in last night, no matter how good it is. Who owns it? The owner adds value to common things. Who do you belong to? You're a child of God. You're a son or daughter of God. The, the Bible says you've been bought with the price, the precious blood of Christ. He owns you. He bought you. He paid for you. You are His. And because you are His, you belong to Him, and your value is off the charts. It is sky high. What makes me valuable? God makes me valuable. It's not anything I've done or could do or say. It's God. You're a child of God. You belong to Him. Also, the price somebody is willing to pay. Listen. The ultimate price was paid for you. Jesus Christ, the perfect Son of God, died for you. The ultimate price. The ultimate price. How much does Jesus love you? I heard somebody say he loves you this much. And he died on the cross. He died on the cross. He paid the price. So how do you remember every day the way God loves you? Get up in the morning and say, God, I just want to remind myself how much you love me. I'm completely accepted. 
I'm loved by you. I'm forgiven. I'm a child of God. Say those things. Remind yourself of those things because the devil wants you to forget those things. The devil wants you to forget it. He wants you to get up in the morning and say, woe is me. I'm no good. I have nothing. I am nothing. And the devil will be cheering you on saying, that's right. I told you. You're no good. How could God ever love you? Listen, rebuke those thoughts and say the truth. I am accepted by God. I am forgiven. I am loved by God. I am valuable to God. And walk in God's love because, friends, that is the truth that will set you free. The love of Christ. Every day I surrender to God, I remember He loves me. Number three, every day I offer that same love to others. The same love that God gives to me, the Bible says, I'm to offer to everyone else. You see, it's not just that I'm a big receptacle of God's love. It's not just I stand there and say, oh God, pour it out on me, Lord. Fill me with your love. He expects us to go forth and love other people. And right now you're going, well, I like the first part better than the second part. Jesus said this in John 13, I'm giving you a new commandment to love each other. Love each other in the same way that I have loved you. It's not an option. It's not a suggestion. If you are a follower of Christ, you must love everybody, whether you like them or not. Loving someone doesn't mean you approve of everything they do. Loving somebody doesn't mean they're pleasant. Loving somebody means that they are valuable because Jesus died for them, and you're going to show them the greatest amount of love you can. Love people. Be willing to forgive people and consider them valuable. Think for a moment, if we treated people like that, it would transform our relationships. The Bible says in Romans 15, 7, accept one another just as Christ accepted you. In other words, the same way that Jesus accepted you, accept people. What's that mean? It means I must accept everybody the way Jesus accepts me. I must love people the way Jesus loves me. I must forgive the way Jesus forgives me. I must value the way Jesus values me. A translation of 1 Corinthians 13, 7 says, Love never stops being patient. Love never stops believing. Love never stops hoping. Love never gives up. And that's what real love is. And that's how God loves you. God never stops being patient with you. Aren't you glad? He never stops being patient. God never stops believing in you, no matter how many mistakes that you make. God never gives up on you. And that's what God expects you to do with everyone else. Love never stops being patient. That means that love extends grace. Love never stops believing. That means love expresses faith. It never stops. It says, I believe in you. I know you've had a tough time. I know you've had this failure. But I am not going to stop believing in you. Love extends grace and expresses faith. Love expects the best and never stops hoping. So love extends grace expresses faith, expects the best, and never stops hoping. Love extends grace, expresses faith, expects the best, never stops hoping. And love endures the worst. It never gives up. Love is when you say to somebody, you can throw everything at me that you want, but I'm going to still love you. You can be as unkind as you want, but I'm still going to love you. You can fail as much as you want, but I'm still going to love you because I'm not going away. Because guess what? Jesus does this with me, so I'm going to turn around. I'm going to give his love to you. I'm going to give his love to you. Friends, how do you do this? You can't do it in your own strength because no one has it in us to love like that. No one has it in us. How do you 